You've entered Bookstorm with Kristen Civiletto and me, Chris Storm. This is a podcast devoted to best-selling books that matter, books that make a difference. We're diving down deep with beloved authors about their stories. We're exposing hot-button topics and heartfelt themes, the issues that affect each of us in our own lives as siblings, parents, partners, friends, as human beings. We're braving new ideas, fresh thoughts, hard lessons and important truths. Those kinds of things that stay with us long after we turn the last page and close the book. Welcome back, Bookstorm Podcast lovers and book lovers. We have been listening to when you're writing into us. As you know, last year, we had the beloved author Sandra Brown with us. And we have a special treat for you today because she is back with us again with our new novel, Out of Nowhere. And Sandra, welcome back. Thank you so much for having me back. I I was just thrilled when I saw that you were on the schedule. Appreciate it. And thanks everyone for joining in. Yes, we're so excited. So let me tell you a little bit about Sandra Brown that maybe you don't know. We were just discussing with her. Did you know that she is the author of 75 New York Times bestsellers? Wow. What an amazing accomplishment. She's been writing professionally since 1981. Her books have been published over 80 not novels and upwards of 80 million copies of her books are in print worldwide and all in the hands of all book lovers like bookstorm podcasts thoroughly enjoying every one of them you will remember sandra because of her episode on true tv murder by the book she also appeared on investigation discovery series called hardcover mysteries and as if that isn't enough Her television movies have been made of French Silk, Smokescreen, Ricochet, and the White Hot novels, which were some of them my favorites, and we loved seeing this on television. Now, Sandra has an honorary doctorate of humane letters from Texas Christian University, and I have to add this because I love it so, where she and her husband, Michael Brown, have instituted a wonderful literary fiction scholarship. It's called the Sandra Brown Excellence in Literary Fiction, or ELF, and it is given to a student who demonstrates academic excellence and significant potential for writing fiction. And what a wonderful legacy to leave behind. Thank you so much for sharing your uh, success with these young writers, Sandra. Well, thank you. Uh, Each year when uh, the recipient is chosen, not by me, it's uh, the the, the faculty CE sent to universities with reciprocity and they're read by judges in a blind submission. They don't know your writer, uh, but they are judged completely blindly. Um, and it's for a rising junior. So they have already demonstrated um, a love of writing and an ability. Uh, but what I wanted was the, to help kind of give it to an aspiring author their last two years at TCU. And they could come in from other universities, by the way, junior colleges. We've had two that came from junior colleges and were able to complete their education at TCU, which has excellent curriculum and uh, a very active uh, writing program. And so it, it was it's a good thing all around. It, it's um, I, I'm so uh, rewarded when I get to meet the recipient. Well, thank you for doing that because what you're also doing, Sandra, you are sowing seeds and it's going to be so fun to see what these young authors do throughout their lives, many years to come. And then when they accomplish something, they're going to be thanking you for it. Well, I, it's not the gratitude I want so much as just the, as you said, it, it's, it's, uh, it's very nice to, to have, left that legacy and if I can inspire writers we need to we need inspired writers correct uh so that we can cultivate readers because that's my real fear is that we're losing 
readers where um, people are engaged in other forms <laughs> of, of uh, recreation. And um, I can't imagine my life, as I'm sure that the two of you cannot imagine your life without books and without reading. Um, but there's a whole, you know, masses of people right now that are choosing other things and uh, ways of communication. And still a book is a book is a book. I mean, I don't think there will ever be anything that will replace it. So anything that I can, any small thing that I can do uh, to help propagate the reading habit, um, especially with young people, you know, if you get them started early, chances are they're going to be a reader for life. But I'm really encouraged on one level that I get a lot of fan mail from people who said, I never read. I thought it was boring. And then, you know, something would have happened in their life that uh, caused someone to give them a book and say, while you're laid up or while you're on your trip or whatever, read this. And they write me and say, I read one book and now I've read 25 of your books in three months, you know? So that makes me always feel good is when I have cultivated, created a reader. You absolutely have, absolutely. because Krista and I could not put this book down and we're going to dive Thank into it. You. I've got to say one more thing for our listeners, though, because you have worked so hard and earned this so much. And I want people to be aware. Sandra also serves as the president of Mystery Writers of America. She was named Thriller Master which is the top award given by the International Thriller Writers Association. Some other honors include the Texas Medal of Arts Award for Literature, the Romance Writers of America Lifetime Achievement Award, and I can't leave without saying she has gone on two tours with the USO to Afghanistan and Cuba and Thank you so much for sharing your beautiful stories with us. You have given us a love for writing, but also everything else that you're doing for reading and writing is just so wonderful. Thank you. Well, thank you. Well, wonderful. Well, we're here to talk about Out of Nowhere. We loved this story and we like to give the thank listeners you kind of a, a setup of what the book is about, but I'm going to tell you, it's kind of hard because you have a lot of twists and turns and we cannot give away any spoilers. Anything. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to give us a little bit of a, a, a background. And if you want to add anything, of course, we would love for you to do that. In the story, we meet Elle Portman. Now she is a yes. children's book author. And one night she is on her way out from the Texas County Fair with her two-year-old son. And the unthinkable happens there is a shooter who opens fire into the crowd. Now there's widespread panic that erupts around them and a person near her, Calder, he's also caught up in this mayhem. He, let's kind of talk a little bit about who he is because he becomes central to the story. He's arrogant, he's self-centered, he's coming off a, a career win high and he's very frustrated and confused when he wakes up in the hospital after undergoing surgery. The doctor tells him he was very lucky because he was shot. And as far as gunshots go, he really survived and is going to be okay. But there were others who did not survive. And Calder begins to nurture a, a focus for justice, something outside of himself, yes. which is a beautiful plot line throughout the story. Now, Elle, of course, shares these feelings. She has experienced some trauma. And they have a chance encounter at the police station. And the two have this gravitational pull towards one another. And as this attraction goes, they start to wonder about this potential attraction. And of course, whether or not this tragedy is something that can sustain them. Can they have a relationship in the face of what they both experienced? Now, this story right. uh, was one that kept us invested. I don't know if I should say any more, so I'm going to leave it to you if you'd like to add anything to that. Well, thank you for doing that wonderful job of capsulizing it. I'm not sure I could have done it. I would have I would have waxed poetic for 40 minutes, but uh, <laughs> it, it wasn't that I, as I said in the author's note, uh, which I also, they asked me to read for the audio book because they said it was so personal that, um, other than Keith Brewer, uh, the reader of this book, who was amazing, but they said it should really come from your voice, which is 
<laughs> it's a Texas voice. But um, I was glad they did that because I hesitated uh, for weeks and weeks about doing uh, a book about uh, one of the tragedies of our present society globally. And uh, um, I didn't want people to think that it was about so much the shooting as how people, how, how was the, the question that I kept asking myself, how does anyone overcome even being in the vicinity of this and witnessing things that they never in their lifetime thought they would witness? Thus the title, um, out of nowhere, these two people, strangers to each other, totally different uh, life circumstances. And yet when this happens, this bond, and it, there's a little bit more to it than Kristen uh, said, which I'm glad of, but uh, this bond that is created uh, as a consequence of this tragedy was really what I wanted the story to be about. How does one go about picking up the pieces? And I remember um, I started writing it uh, soon after the Uvalde, Texas shooting, school shooting. And, uh, you know, for weeks, maybe two weeks, on the nightly news every night, there was a follow-up story about it. And we heard about, you know, the investigation and the blame and the and everything and the survivors um, and the, the families of the victims and everything. But then they, they were supplanted by the next round. And I thought, it, you know, how, how you're going through the worst possible period of your life. And for a while, it's on everyone's mind. And then everybody else kind of goes back into their routine. They forget it. They forget the name of the town. What was that? It was that weird name town in Texas, you know, where they had the school shit. So we get inured to hearing about this. But to the people it happens to that are even tangentially connected to it, it changes their life forever. Nothing will ever be the same for them. And so I wanted my story to be mostly about Elle and about Calder, totally different, but yet united, bonded by this common experience. So thank you, Kristen, for that, um, that summary. There are so many elements to this book uh, that that, and I'm happy you found it gripping. I'm happy that you you found it engaging because uh, even from you know the first the uh, prologue where we're in the mind of the culprit, uh, I didn't even know if I was going to do that. I waited until I got about ten chapters into the book, and I thought. The reader needs to see the clear and present danger. This, you know, and and um, so that's why I did those um, insertions in the in the first person in the head of the of the culprit. I hope it. I hope that tactic worked, but it it did. It, it kind of added, yeah, kind of made so it real. a eeriness, yeah. An eeriness and a reality to it. And my first question just ties right in with that because we saw L and Calder as the two survivors. Now they knew death. They knew someone who had died. They had to come out and deal with this together. Um, we saw them questioning themselves. Could they have prevented it as the survivor? Is there something more I could have done? But then I thought it was amazing and I wondered, what did you instill in each of them? These are two very different types of people. One more extrovert, one more introvert, yet each of them seemed to be able to overcome that grief, the trauma, and pursue justice. And as the reader, I thought, it gave us hope. I thought, I wonder if I would be capable of coming out of oh, trauma. I and what, what did it take for them or maybe for each of us in the real world to continue to live and push towards a cause or a hope or a dream? Well, my heroes and heroines are always uh, smarter, uh, 
cleverer, um, much more heroic. I mean, I'm a card carrying coward. So um, it, it, if my my heroes and, and heroines behave in a much more courageous uh, pattern than I ever would. And and they, after all, they're the uh, they're the pivotal people. They're the characters that we want to care about, that we have to admire. Sometimes we get mad at them, but we have to admire their effort, even when they fail, because most of us would have a much a, a harder time. So you want the hero of the myth to be a larger than life. And in this regard, it's kind of emotionally. But I think when you go back, um, Chris, to your question about what, what inside them, if you go back and, and you think about it, Calder's first reaction in the hospital was after he kind of realizes what's happened to him is anger. He wants the son of a bitch. You know, he even disparages this individual uh, in his mind, this unknown, unidentified individual. So, and also Els, when she is first told certain circumstances, which I won't give away, her initial reaction is rage, is fury. Uh, she, and so neither had closure on this thing. So I think that in both instances, anger was a big motivator initially. And then I, I wouldn't say that they kind of, um, I forgot what word you used, but they overcame uh, their grief. I don't think that, I think they learned to use it constructively. I think they, uh, it propelled them also to make things better. They were never going to be right. Uh, nothing was ever going to be right again, totally 100% right, but they used uh, their grief also as motivation to move forward. They had work to do, in other words, they had work to do. And so both in their careers, but also toward resolution, emotional resolution of the problem, besides the very real problem that is the clear and present danger. So, um, I, and it, it, that's a long answer to your question, but I think they, they use the emotions that they that were forced upon them to propel them. I, I love that you said that about anger. First, we always think of anger as being something negative. Don't be angry with each other, deal with your emotions. But in this case, anger strengthened them to persevere. Yeah. And I never realized that. And I wanna ask you one more question with this that I had. Elle said there was some guilt to being a survivor for she and Calder. Oh, and there was a quote that I love. She said, if you allow this undue guilt to become ingrained in you, you had just as well have died in the shooting because the life you could and should have had will have ended that day. And I thought, yeah. wow, you know, you, how many of us survive a lot of things in life, uh, trauma, um, sicknesses that we see friends and family going through. And we would sometimes feel guilty that we're allowed to live, but she gave us such a clear understanding of why you must continue. And we know that that isn't just Elle, it's also the writer, Sandra Brown, offering those words of wisdom. Well, <laughs> thank you. But, uh, but, you know, my characters say, say things that are a whole lot more insightful <laughs> than what I would say, but um Thank you for that. And I wrote, rewrote that sentence about, I don't know how many times, uh, because it, it is, it, it's very telling. But I think there is a lesson there. Uh, survivor's guilt is a terrible thing to, to have to, to deal with. And, um, and I think, again, it, it has to be channeled positively or you're enabling that person a victory. In other words, you're giving that the individual who inflicted that on you a power over you that you either can succumb to or you have to come out. I'm not going to let this kill me. 
you know, the, the, the shooter tried one time, I'm not going to allow that individual to have wound up taking my life anyway, even though I'm still breathing. What a lesson. There's a lesson in there. Thank you. Sandra, there's another underlying theme in your story that really caught my attention. And that is this idea of being fulfilled by what you do. And I loved thinking about this with Calder because he spent a good portion of his career handling difficult matters. He was surrounded by negativity and sometimes he was the cause of that negativity, legal, but still negative. And I wanted to ask you, you know, it provided a great life for him. But is that trade off something that maybe people have to evaluate at some point in their life? Is it worth it for this great life to be also surrounded by incredibly negative things and not be fulfilled by what you do? What do you think? Well, I think in Calder's mind, uh, in fact, I know in Calder's mind, uh, he didn't see what he, he didn't see the neg negativity in what he did. He saw it uh, as a positive that he was doing a job very, very well, for which he was compensated very, very well. And he was hired to do a job and, and he did it. So in his mind, prior to the tragic event, he, he saw it as a I'm doing what they're paying me to do and I'm the best at it. And I loved the, I loved the character arc for him because um, he came out of, you know, chapter one on top of the world. He's cocky. He's celebrating, you know, he, and all of his thoughts are selfish. All of them are, man, there is nobody as good as I am at this. And so he, he wasn't regarding it. He wasn't thinking about it the negative side to this and uh, how it affected other people. And, uh, and then I loved when it occurred to him that, wait a minute, you know, is that really, is that really honorable? And it was, he was being paid to do a job. And as Elle even said, well, if you hadn't done that, wouldn't all these other consequences have come about? They would have been different, but there would have still been consequences. And if you hadn't done that job. So, uh, but he was torn about it. And I think it was more not so much about the job he was doing that certainly contributed to it, but, was, but it was also kind of a hyperbole of, uh, that he, he saw within himself a need to change wasn't so much the job it was it kind of represented what happened to him after the shooting event is that he underwent a, an introspection uh that was much much deeper than just about the job I I, so i i really I, I loved exploring and also and i don't want to give this aspect away but but the bond that really connected him to Elle, unlike the connection he had with other survivors, I mean, they had a very definite and specific, uh, it was uh, a tangible link. Uh, and so that, that was another thing that I think he just, you know, he couldn't get past. Um, and I loved the line, and I thought about this line just after I started writing the book and I thought, oh, when I get to that point, I've got to remember this line. And I remember jotting it down where he says, I have an issue with failure. And she kind of huffs a laugh and says, when have you ever failed at anything? And he says, never. Absolutely. Not until, not until it counted. And Absolutely. so that that represented a failure to, to him. He had achieved everything he'd ever set out to do and it had been a breeze. It had been easy. He'd been star kissed. And all of a sudden, none of that, the one time he shouldn't have failed, you know, he saw it as a failure. So I thought that was very telling about his character. Absolutely. It really caused you to think about being satisfied and fulfilled 
by your choices. And, you know, right. Elle, of course, had a very different Thanks. position and job. And, right. and look at how much she was able to process and share through her work. Yeah. Yeah. I, I thought they both uh, were, well, I lived with them for a year. <laughs> right. <laughs> I got to know them pretty well. <laughs> I hope I conveyed all of those emotions and, and, and uh, my regard for both of them. I hope I conveyed that, uh, that, that here were two people who were just going about their lives and and out of nowhere, their life will never be the same. Great title, right? Great <laughs> title. Great title. And I love that line. I remember that line and it was fantastic. It falls in line with my next question. I want to talk about another quote. Both L and Calder once thought, and I'm going to quote, it's crazy. Us talking about pistols that I lifted from two dead men? Never in a million years would I have predicted I could do something like that. Whose life am I living? You think you have a handle on your life, on your future, and then you get zapped with something that in an instant before you would have, would have been unthinkable. And I thought their pursuit for justice made the reader wonder, what are we all capable of? What pushed your characters to behave outside the norm? Was it adrenaline, revenge? Was it just justice, protection? Or maybe it was something they had inside them always and didn't know. Well, I would think they would have to have had something because, as, as I've said, I don't know that I would have had the fortitude uh, that they did to to even attempt to get up in the morning. I mean, I, I just I don't know how you would even awaken and have that moment of non-memory and then all of a sudden the memory of it and the horror uh, slam into you. I think I would have pulled the cover over my head. Um, uh, but again, they're the hero and the heroine. And I think possibly, um, uh, but each of them had, uh, different strengths. Um, his was one, a, a very, I think, male reaction is to, I'm going to find him and I'm, you know, <laughs> I'm going to get the bad person and um and Elle's was more uh hers was not revenge but um what's the word I'm looking for like vindication get, it, it, she was doing it for someone else she was doing it uh, as a way of reconciling herself to what had happened she never would have let that go uh after what happened to her. Um, she just would not let it go. And uh, so they were coming from two different perspectives. One, a more female perspective, another, a more male perspective, I think. Um, and, but I, I think each of them had to have elements of their character that would have enabled them once they resolved to do this. And there were times when they were were shaky. There were times when they questioned, you know, uh, what what they had set out to do. But by the same token, that here again, they're the hero and the heroine. There's no way in hell they were going to let this just go. <laughs> you know, they they had to had to do something. Uh, and and in that regard, it also had to be an action driven book. Uh, this is where I kind of struggled because. I thought it can't just be about them sitting around uh, commiserating with each other, uh, going to the group therapy sessions and talking through it all because the reader already knows what they've been through. The question was, how are they going to deal with it? And so I couldn't just keep rehashing over and over again what had happened it had to be there had to be some kind of propulsion there they had to move uh not just remain static and uh so that's when I was like okay you've got these two characters linked inextricably through this happenstance bizarre happenstance a tragic event and uh would never would have known each other otherwise and um and so how do I then 
build the emotional relationship that's growing out of just knowing each other and sharing what they're sharing, but also how do I keep it a suspense novel? There has to be a, oh my gosh, you know, what's going to happen next? So that's when I created the villain. Um, and I can't say anymore. <laughs> it's so hard not to be able to say anymore, but I love that you brought them together. So it showed the reader the power of unity, even if you're not alike, when we join forces to fight against evil and even opposites, everyone brings different strengths to the table and we yeah. loved their strengths, but we also loved their weaknesses because we could relate to them. We wanted right. to be them. And we hoped that should we ever endure something like this, we would be able to garner that same courage and fortitude. Thank you for taking us there. Thank you. <laughs> I'd like to kind of pick Thank up on that. Um, yeah. And Sandra, you had mentioned talking about the title, you know, out of nowhere. And it really, of course, reminds us that life is uncertain, that things can change on a dime. And I was wondering if you thought, and maybe your characters thought this too, that it should now influence the way you live every day. Like, I wonder if going forward, they think that. Oh, well, absolutely. I think if you, if any of us watches someone who has undergone a, uh, you know, a, a, a death of a loved one or uh, watched a friend suffer uh, with an illness or anything that, that has a impact uh, on our lives, even from a, a distance, from an observation point, and you're just like, oh my gosh, you know, I can't imagine, but it, it makes you, I think, and just in my own life, uh, it, it, coming to appreciate every single moment of every single day, because you hear about terrible things happening, and uh, uh, my uh, daughter lost a an acquaintance in a horrible automobile accident and she was just newly wed and and it was it was and she was you know very young and uh it was just and she was you know going to work one morning and you think how do how, how does your family how to how do your how did her husband you know pick up the pieces but it also those around them like myself and my daughter were just like, you never know when you tell somebody goodbye that that's not going to be the last time. So if you left angry, would you ever forgive yourself? And would you from then on make a point? And I love, of course, I'm a big country Western uh, country song fan, but Tim McGraw's Live Like You Were Dying mm -hmm. is yeah. a perfect example of not wasting a moment of your day uh, regretting something or uh, dreading something or mad at somebody uh, or giving someone that ruined your day the ability to do that. Why not just, you know, blow it off? Don't stay mad at that person that cut you off from your exit, you know? They probably didn't even know. And even if they did, that's their problem. Don't let it affect you to that extent. And we all do. I do. You know, you get mad at the fried chicken drive through when they don't get your order right. It's like, <laughs> you know, how can you carry that with you? It's like, oh, my God. So uh, I think it, it naturally uh, would make you appreciate what you have in the moment, which leads us to the love story and out of nowhere, because it was like, this is the here and now. And um, Calder began very quickly uh, to see the, uh, you know, the, the crevices in his relationship with his live-in lady. And, um, and it began very quickly uh, to crumble under the pressure uh, they both, and, and maybe I was a little bit unfair to her in, in some regards, but not really, but um, maybe I was a little bit unfair because I think a lot of people would have also a, a partner of someone that something happened to, you can't share that experience. You can sympathize and you, but 
to know the depth of that suffering would take a very special individual. And Shauna, the character in the book, <laughs> was not that individual. <laughs> she was way too full of Shauna. Uh, but I, I think it, she was a relatable character too, in that, you know, how, how do you cope when somebody near you that, that you love and care about their inability to cope all of a sudden. So, yeah, but I think he started to see really quickly that this, this was not a, a healthy environment for him while he was trying to recover. Well, that's why we love this story so much because, you know, we've talked about some very deep and heavy themes, but it also thrilled and entertained and ultimately was about embracing life. And so we thank you. We, we loved it. We, we love your books, but this one in particular, thank really, you. we've been talking and talking about it. We love it. We well, just thank you so much. Listeners, you you know, you already love Sandra Brown. You've read so many of her novels. We just adore her here on Bookstorm Podcast. And we say, you've got to go out and get this book out of nowhere. It's a real treasure. It's entertaining. It's fun, but it's so heartfelt and really will make you think about your own life and your own self. And Sandra, before we let you go now, can you give us a clue what you're working on next? Well, let's see. Here are some notes. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Something wonderful, I'm sure, is coming. I actually, uh, I, I actually uh, had a free afternoon. <laughs> I had a free afternoon, and uh, I thought I can sit down and read a book just for leisure. But I always feel like I'm way arch when the book, my next book, come comes due. So uh, I just came to the computer and started writing and couldn't wait to see what was going to happen. It was just like, I'll just open it up and see what happens. And by the time I got through it, 13 pages. Wow. So it's not a story yet. <laughs> it's it not a story it. yet, but yes, I'm already thinking about it. Well, you are just absolutely amazing. 75 New York Times bestsellers, and you are so creative to still be coming up with fresh, new, and current ideas. And I've got to say to our listeners, you want to connect with Sandra Brown, you can find her on our website, sandrabrown.net, where she has a newsletter. You can find her on Twitter, Facebook, and Pinterest. We just love having you on Bookstorm. I hope you're going to come back again next year with this next book. Oh, thank you, Chris. Thank you, Kristen. I always enjoyed. Thank you so much for having me. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you both. Bye-bye. Well, that was a fantastic discussion. She is amazing. And I just love these multi-layered plots and multi-layered discussions that we have been having. And a couple of things kind of leapt out to me. And Chris, what do you think about this whole idea, first of all, of, you know, picking up the pieces and moving on after trauma? I mean, that that is very powerful. I loved what she said. You know, she when she talked about anger, you almost think of the five stages of grieving process. And I feel like these characters entered those. And maybe there is a reason why we need to face all of these different stages of grieving. Even if it seems like it's a waste of time, it isn't. Maybe it's healing. Maybe it's giving us an empowerment from deep within that we didn't know we had. Um, yes, I, I cannot even imagine. And I wouldn't, I will never be the judge of someone else who's coming out of a trauma. Of course, we try to help. But like Sandra said, with Shauna, the character Shauna, you really can't understand it unless you live through it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I also was very interested in this idea of being satisfied and fulfilled by what you do. And, you know, we had a character here who was very full of himself for good reason. He was good at what he did. He got paid a lot of money. But at some point, what he did didn't make sense to him because he had changed on the inside. Have you ever been in a situation where you had to make that evaluation about what you're doing and does it line up with who you are? Yeah, I loved, I loved when we saw that arc in his growth and it actually took, I don't think this is a spoiler, him meeting someone and seeing something through someone else's eyes. 
I think sometimes our greatest growth doesn't always come from within our own needs or wants or desires. It's empathy, understanding towards another person or another cause. Like, have you heard that saying, the best way to get rid of your problems is to help someone else with theirs? And I think it's so true. We forget about our selfish desires. We begin to help someone else and we find strengths that we never knew we had. I loved that part too. Absolutely. How about you? Yeah, to me, it was just a maturity and that ability to see outside yourself and adopt and adapt and change and grow that that's the maturity we all hope for, you know, throughout the course of our lives. And I just have to add one more thing that I really loved. So L and Calder, Sandra said, began a relationship. So that's not a spoiler, but truly they were the least likely candidates who would ever meet in the, in their real worlds. It took a tragedy or a trauma that pushed them together. And I couldn't help but think what set it off. Was it desperation to join and, uh, and find justice or was it desperation for a human connection at that point in their lives? Um, and even if it didn't last, was it something they both needed at that one point in time? What did you feel about that relationship? I had so many questions about it. What attracts anyone to anyone else? So many different crazy things. Some of them not healthy, truly. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, this one could have gone either way because I think, you know, a sense of justice united them. And as they wanted to see certain things happen, their interests really aligned. And then, of course, there was chemistry. You know, we can't leave that out of the equation here either, because for some reason there was, well, I can, I know the reasons I don't want to say there was an incredible chemistry between these two. And, you know, you hope it can go the distance when it's motivated by something like that. But certainly you can see where they were pulled together. This is what I love about Sandra Brown's writing, because I always know there's going to be wonderful romance involved, but also a mystery to be solved or something intriguing that pushes you forward. And she's just so fabulously amazing. And we love her and um, bookstorm lovers and listeners. Listen, you think you love Sandra Brown. You've got to pick up this next book out of nowhere. You're going to go crazy over it. And in the meantime, let me give you a few storm predictions to pique your interest. And I'm going to say it quick because we've got a great list for this summer and fall lineup. Madeline Martin, the keeper of hidden books, Alex Hay, housekeepers, Brian Freeman, writing for Robert Ludlam, Born Defiance, Cherie Lapina, everyone here is lying, Rebecca Yaros, The Iron Flame, Jake Tapper, All Demons Are Here, Dindeen Milner, One Blood, Jacqueline Machard, A Very Inconvenient Scandal, James Rowland, Tides of Fire, Michael Ledgewidge, The Girl in the Vault, John Mars, The Vacation, wow, can't wait for all of them. I know, me too. And listeners, thank you. We're growing every week. It's due to the fact that you are listening. You are enjoying these authors. These fantastic people are coming on and talking about these deeper themes underlying their stories. And I think you want to hear that kind of discussion. That's what we're hearing. So, of course, we want you to keep joining us. We are on bookstormpodcast.com. You can find us on Facebook, on Instagram, on TikTok, on Twitter. And if you want to see us in person and see our fantastic authors, you can find us on on YouTube. Just search for Bookstorm and Podcast and we should come right up. And of course, until next time, listeners, one of the best ways to brave the storm is to dive down deep into life-changing fiction. 